Hello, everyone. This is Adam Dunstan. I'm excited to be with you today. I do want to apologize for the lecture being late in posting. We had some serious medical issues, some really serious medical issues in our home this past week, uh, which delayed my completion of this lecture. However, I am excited to be here with you and to give this lecture uh, because it is a particular favorite topic of mine. It is indeed what most of my career has been about researching. Um, and it looks like it's also a particular topic of interest for many of you. Not only do we have several students whose careers are sort of environmentally focused or their career trajectory, but also we just have a lot of people in the class who in their assignment ones expressed a strong interest in the relationship between land and culture. You know, a lot of people also that think the tourism site's interesting, but a lot of people that you know, first and foremost, what they want to get out of this class is better understanding how land is connected to culture. So there, we're going to touch on that theme throughout the entire course. But in this lecture, we are going to kind of touch on, lay some groundwork by talking about some of the different theories and ideas that anthropologists and other scholars have come up with about the connection between land and culture. Uh, because on some level, I think we all kind of get that they're connected, right? It doesn't take a genius to understand that there's got to be some connection there. Um, and various people have pointed this out. Wendell Berry, a famous American environmentalist author, <clears throat> he says, we and our country create one another. So I want to repeat that. We and our country create one another. I want to us to think about what that means today. It's an easy thing to kind of agree to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sounds right. But I want us to really dive into that and peel that apart and say, okay, but what does that mean? How does our land and our community sort of create one another? What does that mean? That was part of the idea in um, assigning you to read a chapter from Thomas Thornton's excellent book, Being in Place Among the Clinket. I've got a little bit of feedback that some people felt kind of lost in some of the theoretical um, terminology um, and jargon and terminology um, in that chapter. And, you know, when I was assigning this chapter, this is my first time running this course, and I really went back and forth about this one, this chapter or the chapter that comes immediately after it, which is more ethnographic and into the cult, clinket culture and less theoretical. I ultimately decided on chapter one because I wanted you to be introduced to some of these ideas like placemaking. But I can see now, having given gotten people's feedback, I probably won't do this chapter again. We'll probably instead assign chapter two because it's a fantastic book. But I really want you to, the core of what I wanted you to get out of that chapter, I didn't want you to try to memorize all of those terms. The core of what I wanted you to get at is this idea of place as being central to sort of identity, especially for indigenous people, but really for all people and on some levels. And that placemaking, right? This idea of how people make a space into a place, how they make the land meaningful to them and part of their identity. And so that was kind of where I was going with that chapter. And I realized now that perhaps assigning chapter one was not the best way to get there, that I probably should have assigned a different part of the book. So I apologize. Um, I do hope if you ever get the chance that you'll take the opportunity to read the rest of the book. It's really fascinating stuff. Um, and, you know, since one or two people did mention sort of some of the very confusing terminology, I did want to point out that I, that's certainly something I relate to. I remember my first year in graduate school just feeling like I was just kind of like lost in a haze sometimes with the uh, different terms that were being thrown around. Um, you know, I hope there's a few that I wanted to explain, not so much because you need to know them, but just to kind of show you a point that I want to make, which is that often these complex technical theoretical terms are really just a way of smushing several simpler terms together. Um, and to do that um, sometimes is very helpful for us as scholars, but sometimes um, can make it unclear for people that are sort of just starting out in the field. So again, I apologize if this was not the best reading to assign. You can go through that list on your own time at some point. But I did want to jump into talking about Klingit culture. So um, Klingit culture is one of our 20 Alaska native languages and slash cultures here in Alaska and also found in part of Canada. Klingit are sort of 
distant linguistic relatives of our Athabascan groups, which is why you see them colored here in the map in yellow in relation to kind of the summer colors of these Athabascan groups. Klingit are sort of distantly related um, to the Athabascan language family as part of this bigger thing we call the not Ne language family. Sort of like how over in the old world, you have, quote unquote, you have sort of the Indo-European language family, but then a bunch of other families that go under that, such as the Romance languages. In a similar vein, you have Athabascan, but then that fits within like a bigger language family called not Dene, and Klingit are part of that as well. Klingit, um, whether people realize it or not, people are often very familiar with Klingit iconography or Klingit visual art, right? Whether it's totem poles or whether it's red and black paintings of various crests, especially um, imagery of stylized imagery of things like killer whales. Um, a lot of what people, especially outsiders outside of Alaska, a lot of what people tend to think of as sort of Alaska native art, oftentimes a big part of what they're thinking about is sort of Klinka art, or maybe also Haida art, um, Tsimshian art, Iyak art. But anyways, Klinga are a group of people then that have lived um, since time immemorial um, in the kind of coastal southeast region of Alaska. And when one of the things that the reading did not bring up, but that is interesting and that I want to bring up about Klinga people and how their culture is connected to land, is that Klingit people traditionally have had some very, for lack of a better word, genius adaptations to that specific landscape that they find themselves in. So a good example is Klingit intertidal fishing. This is a diagram by Steve Langton, um, formerly of University of Alaska Anchorage. And he shows us a picture here of sort of how this was done traditionally, but basically large stone um, semicircles and things like that, that then when the tide is coming in, fish get trapped in those. And then when it goes back out, they're kind of trapped in this little area and you can come and you know pick them out or spear them out. Uh, um, or net them out, whatever the case may be. And oftentimes they're designed in such a way, as you can see from this diagram, there's plenty of chances for escapement, right? Plenty of areas where you wouldn't catch any fish. And um, Langdon implies that that is intentional, right? People were intentionally not catching all of the fish that they could have if they had designed the traps a little bit differently. Um, but this is a very genius way to make use of the fact that you're a coastal, um, very island slash coastal based part of Alaska, right? This would not make as much sense in other areas, even other coastal areas like Denina territory, but it makes sense in Klingit territory, right? And so people being profoundly affected by the land in the sense that they have adapted themselves to that land. So when we get to that idea of how do land and culture create each other, this is a good example of that. Um, and more generally, of course, Klingit territory and identity are not just intertwined in terms of sort of how people make a living, but also on kind of a more symbolic level or more of a social level, how people think about themselves is combined with the land. So this is a map of traditional Klingit country that looks rather different than the maps we usually see um, that are focused on sort of settler forms of governance. This is instead focused on, more on what different forms of Klingit social organization existed as well as other Southeast groups like the Tsimshian or the Haida, um, but what different Klingit social organizations and governances existed prior to colonialism and to some degree to this day. And what you'll see there is that Klingit territory is a combination, I like to sometimes say of clans and quans. And what I mean by that is people were organized by their clans as well as their bigger moieties. So clan being like a group of people that are related to each other somewhat sometimes somewhat distantly, usually from kind of like a common founder, but who kind of act as a collective, for example, throw ceremonies together. And then you have moieties, which if you're not familiar with that term, basically a moiety is kind of like a, a mega clan, a clan of clans. It's when a society is divided in two, in this case, when Klingit culture is divided into two. And on one half is the raven moiety people, and on one, the other half is eagle or sometimes wolf moiety. And these are exomicomists. So if you're raven, you marry people in eagle. If you're eagle, you marry people in raven and so forth. If somebody in Raven dies, then people in Eagle do like a memorial potlatch for them, things like that. There's like this kind of balanced opposition between them and they kind of act as two fundamental groups of society. So you have clans and clans were often attached to specific places, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
But you also have the concept of quans, and I don't speak Klingit, so I might not be pronouncing that very well. But that's how I would pronounce it. Um, and the idea there often gets translated into English as tribes, um, but just like a community of people united by, by geography, they may or may not be clan related to each other. Sometimes you might have people from multiple different lineages or clans in one village. And so you have these two overlapping forms of organization, which together kind of divide up the various lands of the Klingit people. Uh, which brings us back to the point that we often come back to, which is that these lands were not ungoverned prior to settler governance, right? They were just governed in different ways, in this case by kinship and um, by village ship, if you will. But these clans are really interesting from the perspective of how land and culture are connected. There's this concept in Klingit society of at o, or ownership, owned things, literally. Um, sometimes people have this idea that sort of Native Americans, including Alaska Native people under that broad umbrella, didn't believe in owning land. And certainly there are a number of groups for which that is true or kind of true. But what people tend to misunderstand is that it's not so much that people didn't believe in owning land, but rather that people didn't believe in individual people owning land and um, extorting it for profit, like in sort of an industrial capitalist system. Instead, in Klingit society, lands, in a sense, could be owned, but they were owned by clans as a sort of sacred thing that they were attached to. So ownership is a good translation, but we might also say sort of stewardship and connectedness, right? It's sort of this ownership that goes back to time immemorial, to ancient stories where your clan has always been attached to that place, and therefore it's your clan's place, and um, you live there, and you take care of that place. And that's kind of a very tangible form of ownership. Clans also own things that are, from a Western perspective, more intangible and that we don't always think of as possessions. Things like songs, things like sacred dances, um, also things like crests, specific forms of artwork that only that clan is supposed to use. Um, all of these things, these crests, dance, songs, and locations that the clans own kind of are interwoven, right? So for example, places that in English we would translate as sacred places for Klingit people, uh, as Lydia George points out in the chapter that you read, uh, Klingit um, woman, she says, you know, sacred places tend to have names, a specific way we've named them, stories, some kind of sacred story, usually from a very long time ago, usually from the time when animals and humans were much closer together and when more supernatural things occurred, they almost always have songs and dances that go with them that show our connection to that place and remind us of that place. And they almost always have designs or crests, some kind of visual symbolism that marks those place. And so this system of sort of crests and dances and songs ties in with the land ownership, um, all of them working together to be what Tom Thornton calls tools of emplacement, which I really like that term. Emplacement is a kind of fancy way of saying getting people invested in a place, right? Getting people connected to a place. And in a sense, um, we sort of all do emplacement to some degree, right? When you move to a new area and you drive around and get the lay of the land, you're emplacing yourself. But these names, stories, songs, dances, locations all work together as very powerful tools of emplacement for Klingit people that help people from specific clans feel very united to specific lands, even if they're geographically at this point living very distant from there. Let's say somebody might be living in Seattle, but they come back sometime and take part in songs and dances and they remember the crests and the stories that connect them to these far off locations. Um, this, by the way, the specific crest I'm showing you here, um, I'm taking this from a UAF website, but with credit, I'm telling you that, and also pointing out that the image itself is from the Princeton University Art Museum, but it's a killer rail crest, which is a, belongs to specific clans that are allowed to use that as part of marking their own identity, and others are not. Um, as Thomas Thorne points out in his reading, each crest has a story behind it that evokes elements of the present landscape in relation to the distant past. So it fuses members' identities, origin, and history. Now, one of the things as we talk about Klingit traditional storytelling that comes out and that Thornton brings out in the reading, but that I'd like to perhaps bring out a little more obviously, is that place in a sense matters more than time when telling these sacred stories. Um, sometimes anthropologists would call these mythologies, but 
I don't love that term because even though we know what we mean by it as anthropologists, in common English, people sometimes think we mean fictional, and that's obviously not what we mean. So anyways, in the sacred stories and the founding narratives, um, what once upon a time anthropologists would have called myths, whatever you want to call them, in that oral storytelling, um, oftentimes for Alaska Native groups, and Klingit are no exception, time, at least once you go back a certain distance, i.e. before colonialism, time is a little fuzzy. People often don't give exact dates. There's time periods, such as, you know, back when animals spoke, for example, is something you find in several Alaska Native cultures, is there's this time period when animals spoke, and then there's time after that, um, when animals and humans stopped speaking together very much. But time's kind of fuzzy, right? It's not like, oh, this happened in 1776 for us as a people. By contrast, place is extremely precise. People are very, very specific about every single story of where it took place. It is very important to know where you are, partly because it's so tied up with the system of identity and ownership and where you belong and what belongs to you. Um, you see that pattern in other indigenous societies as well. I really don't like to draw broad brushes and sort of draw comparisons across even one continent, much less across entirely separate continents, but it is interesting to note occasionally how patterns play out in other places in similar ways. A good example might be Aboriginal Australian, what um, we often call an English dream time, but this idea that there is a time period that was long ago, or maybe it's parallel to our own. You get kind of different explanations from different people. Um, it's either a earlier time or sort of a parallel timeline to our own, where mythological beings, and again, I don't mean that as fictional, but sacred beings, right, spiritual beings, um, moved around the landscape and had visible effects on what we now as humans experience in the land, right? Rainbow serpent moves around the Australian continent, carving valleys that we now see. Um, two women sit down in an area and become the rock formation uh, two women sitting, which sadly was destroyed, partially destroyed by a mining company, um, BHP Bilton, but that's a story perhaps for another day. But in telling these stories, Aboriginal Australians, um, as might be suggested by the fact that I have to find multiple ways of describing the dream time, the precise way that time works may be less significant than the way the place work. The idea that there really were slash are <laughs> sacred beings that shaped specific places. And as a result, specific clans are attached to specific places through that being that they share an identity with, an ancestral identity, or a being they've always been connected to. Um, and it's notable to note, <laughs> it's notable to note, that's awkward English, but anyways, it's worth pointing out that Aboriginal Australians were able to divide up a huge continent, the continent of Australia, and give all the different clans of territory with, as far as I've ever heard, relatively little territorial warfare, um, in part because they had sacred stories binding them to specific places. So it was kind of clear who belonged to which place. Um, so all of this reminds us of something that I was sometimes told during my field work, people sometimes like to bring up during my research with Navajo people, especially Navajo environmental protectors, you know, as indigenous people, we are people of this land, which, you know, we can see that as being very, very true. And when we hear what we just heard about Klingit society, when we hear what we just heard about Aboriginal Australians, um, indigenous people very much, I mean, that's literally what indigenous means, right? It means sort of child of this area, right? So like native to this area. So indigenous people, people that have been in an area long enough that their culture is deeply, deeply intertwined um, with that specific landscape. This is another example from the um, group Save the Confluence, was, which was such is a group that um, was, or group is maybe the wrong word, but it was a, um, was and is a campaign to have good protections for the confluence of the Colorado and Little Colorado River in Arizona, where there was a proposed um, tram and resort, but which many Navajo people um, shared their attachments to, right? And how it was bound up with stories such as stories of emergence where people came from lower worlds. And so, um, again, this idea of indigenous peoples of the land, a culture that in many ways is intimately connected with that space. And yet, and yet, 
And yet, <laughs> although that is very true and particularly true for indigenous people, on some level, all people, any group of people have to connect to the places they live in in order to survive and to thrive. That is part of the human condition. On a psychological level, we need to feel some sense of, I know where I'm at, right? On an economic and environmental level, we need to have some sense of what the land is and what resources are available to us, whether the resources are a 7-Eleven where I can buy junk food or a river that has always been good for catching salmon. Um, so on a psychological level, on an environmental level, we need to know our land at least somewhat. So to, although indigenous people may be, shall we say, hyper connected to specific lands, it is also true that we could broaden it out a little bit to say that human cultures in general have to be connected to lands in order to survive and to thrive. Or perhaps we might say that if they don't get connected to the land that they're on, that often ends very poorly with, for them. Um, Robin Wall Kimmer, who will be speaking here at KPC, actually at our Kachemak Bay campus in Homer um, in May. So you should definitely go to that. Anyways, she's amazing. She wrote this fantastic book called Braiding Sweetgrass that's all about indigenous knowledge of the land. And then also kind of pairing that with her knowledge as a um, sort of, for lack of a better word, Western trained botanist as well, and how those forms of knowledge have intertwined and taught her fascinating things. But it's also just a great book about like being a human being and like being a parent and investing in a plot of land that you own. It's just a cool book. It's one of the best books I've ever read. But anyways, in that book, um, she says all sorts of interesting things, among other things about how indigenous people are connected to land. But she also makes this kind of interesting and provocative argument that all people need to try to become indigenous to whatever land they're on if we're to survive well into the future. She says, for all of us, becoming indigenous to a place means living as if your children's future mattered. To take care of the land as if our lives, both material and spiritual, depended on it. So again, I, I think I'm trying to say much less eloquently and much less intelligently what Dr. Kimmer is saying, which is that generally speaking, cultures eventually have to find a way to root themselves in place. And if they don't, that tends to end poorly with them. And that's, um, it's part of the kind of necessity of being sustainable is that you need to get to know your place and figure out your place within that place. Um, it's kind of a side effect of the fact that as human beings, we don't have one single ecological niche, one single way of living on the land, but you know, dozens of different ways from small slash and burn agriculture to large scale pastoralism to um, crawdad fishing, right? We've come up with all sorts of ways to make a living. And so humans kind of get to pick how we want to make a living based on what lands we find and what technology we have. Um, but if we're going, but as a result, we have this sort of flexibility and we have to kind of decide as cultures, how are we going to fit in in a sustainable way? which is of course one of the great challenges of our modern time of industrialism. <laughs>